Hey everybody, I'm Jason Walker. I'm a science coordinator with the National Math and Science Initiative and this screencast is the third in a series on botany. And what we're going to discuss in this screencast is plant nutrition and more importantly plant transport. Water and minerals in the soil are absorbed by the roots okay, down here at the bottom of the plant. Basically what's going to happen is this, these water all this water and all these nutrients are going to be pulled up this tree. Transpiration, which is the loss of water from the leaves, mostly through the stomata, is what creates this force that pulls this xylem sap up. How does water get from the roots of a tree to its leaves? The evaporation of water from leaves moves water molecules up from the roots. The evaporation exerts a pull that is relayed downward along a string of water molecules from leaf to root. Hydrogen bonds cause water molecules to stick together, a phenomenon called cohesion. As each water molecule evaporates, it pulls on the next water molecule, and it pulls on the next. This relays the pull of evaporating water molecules all the way down to the roots. The cohesion of water helps to keep gravity from pulling the water molecules back down. It's important to remember that water enters the xylem through different pathways, as shown in the image uh, that we see here. We see that water can, can travel uh, via an apoplastic route, and we can remember apoplastic as water movement around the cell walls. Okay? Or a symplastic route, we can remember symplast is that water is simply going through the cytosol or the cytoplasm. Now the Casparian strip is a band of cell wall deposited on the radial and transverse walls of the endodermis. Now this is chemically different from the rest of the cell wall. It's used to block the passive flow of materials such as water and solutes into the steel of the plant. Endodermis means inner skin. If we look at this word, endodermis, endo means inner, derm means skin, kind of like going to the dermatologist, right? This endodermis is going to regulate what enters the xylem and the phloem, or the steel. The steel is a column of cells found inside the endodermis. Now, a better way and a quicker way to get water in is through aquaporins, okay? Aquaporins allow for only water to move across the membrane. They were discovered by Peter Agri in 1992 when he was studying the Rh blood group antigen. He won the Nobel Prize for his discovery in 2003. Aquaporins are found in both plant and animal cells. In animal cells, we can see an example uh, in the collecting ducts of the kidney. Plants need minerals to synthesize organic compounds such as amino acids, proteins, and lipids. Plants obtain these minerals from the soil and they are transported across uh, into that root hair, in, into the root via these transport proteins because they can't just travel across just through that phospholipid bilayer. It needs some, some, uh, some integral proteins. Okay? So we see three different examples here. We see uh, in A, uh, a membrane potential is, uh, is produced and, it's, and it brings over cations. Okay, through this channel protein. The cation here is potassium. In B and C, we see co-transport where uh, protons are, are used to transport anions or solutes across. Okay? Macronutrients are acquired by plants in relatively large amounts to compose much of the plant structure. So we see some macronutrients. These things are just vital uh, to the function of the plant. Things like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, hydrogen, potassium, calcium, magnesium, silicon, these types of things. Now, of these that I just mentioned, which ones do the plant get from the air? That's right, they can get carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. There are about 11 nutrients essential to plant growth and health that are only needed in very small quantities. We call these micronutrients. These are things like manganese, boron, copper, iron, chlorine, sodium, molybdenum, nickel, cobalt, aluminum, and zinc. Though, though these are present only in small quantities, they're all indeed very, very necessary. Now, 
We see here Michael Rizzi. Now, Michael Rizzi is a mutualistic relationship. So what does mutual mean? Okay, It's basically a I scratch your back, you scratch my back. I do something for you, you do something for me. It's a mutualistic relationship. Basically, in this relationship, we see all this fungal hyphae interwoven within, uh, or I'm sorry, around all these leaves. The fungus is going to benefit from a steady supply of sugar or food that's donated by the host plant via these roots. In return, the fungus benefits the plant by increasing the amount of surface area for water uptake, selectively absorbing minerals that are taken up by the plant, secreting substances that stimulate root growth, and they provide antibiotics that protect the plant from invading bacteria. Gas exchange occurs through the stomata, okay, at the, at the top of the plant here, okay. But let's look at what's going on at the top of the plant, all right, in, these, in, in the shoots and these leaves versus what's going on down here in the roots, Okay. Through the stomata, leaves take in carbon dioxide and they release oxygen. In the roots, the roots exchange gases with air spaces of the soil and they are going to take in oxygen and they are going to release carbon dioxide. So the sugars are produced by photosynthesis in the leaves. Okay, These sugars are going to be uh, they're going to travel in the plant via the phloem sap, which we see in, gr in the green arrows in this picture. Okay, What I need you to understand is phloem can travel up and down, but the xylem, which carries the water and the nutrients, can only travel up. So if these leaves, for instance, need more water, can they get it from this direction? No. No, where's the water and the minerals have to come from? It has to come from down here. That's why it is ridiculous to water the leaves of a plant. You can't water a plant by making sure that the leaves are wet. However, you will um, make sure that you have some fungal growth if that's something that you want your plants to have. So what do we have to do when we water, quote unquote, water plants? We have to water the soil. Because that's how water and nutrients are going to be able to get in, through the roots, right? So the water is in the root. Now what? Root pressure is caused by active distribution of, min of mineral nutrient ions in the root xylem. Okay? Root pressure is the osmotic pressure within the cells of a root system that causes sap to rise through a plant stem to the leaves. This root pressure occurs in the xylem of some vascular plants when the soil moisture level is high either at night or when transpiration is low during the day. When transpiration is high, xylem sap is usually under tension rather than under pressure due to uh, what we mentioned a while ago with the transpirational pull. Okay, Now, let's think about this. Without transpiration to carry the ions up the stem, they will accumulate in the root xylem and they will lower the water potential. Now water potential, um, for right now, we'll explain it in detail here in just a little bit, but for right now, just think of water potential. If you have a high, if a cell has a high water potential, it has a high potential to give away water. And if you have this accumulation of solutes, and this accumulation of minerals and these ions, what are you doing? You're making yourself more and more hypertonic. That is going to lower your potential to give away water. And we say that you have a lower water potential. Okay? At night, in some plants, root pressure causes gutation or exudation of drops of xylem sap from the tips or edges of leaves, as we see in this picture here. So the water is in the root. Now what? Okay? Still talking about now what? Now what are we going to do? Okay? Water then diffuses from the soil into the root xylem due to osmosis. Root pressure is caused by this accumulation of water in the xylem pushing on that rigid, uh, the rigid cells. Root pressure then f uh, provides a force. This provides a force which pushes water up the stem but that's not enough to account for the movement of water to the leaves at the, at the top of the tallest trees. Okay, 
So let's, let's apply some tact to the situation, okay? So a more likely scenario of how does this water get from the roots to, the, to hundreds of feet up in the air and these tall, tall trees, right? It's, it's the more likely scenario is the cohesion tension theory. It's also, can, you can also call it the tension adhesion cohesion transpiration theory or the tact theory. Okay, water is a polar molecule. So let's just stop right here and think about a water molecule. So you see five water molecules here. The red, uh, the red uh, spheres are the oxygen, and they have two hydrogens on each of them. Okay, now the hydrogens and the oxygens are sharing electrons. Okay, but they are sharing them unequally. It's like you and a friend are sharing something, but they always keep it at their house, okay? Which isn't fair, and, and as far as I'm concerned, makes them a little negative, right? So think about this oxygen. The oxygen is very electronegative, and so though they are sharing electrons with the hydrogens, they keep the electrons on their side of the molecule. Now that gives them, because electrons are negative, it gives them a partial negative charge, right? The hydrogens, because they are a little farther away from those electrons, they're quote-unquote sharing, they have a partial positive charge. So we have partial negative oxygens and partial positive hydrogens. So what do opposites do? They attract. So what we see in this picture is we see a hydrogen bond. A hydrogen bond is, a, is a, an intermolecular attraction between two water molecules from that, from that partial positive hydrogen to a partial negative oxygen. Okay, do you see that? So how many, because you've got those two partial negative charges coming off that oxygen and each hydrogen is going to have a partial positive, how many water molecules will fit around this one water molecule? You can fit four around them. You see here and here and here and here. We see four water molecules that's able to surround one water molecule, one water molecule because of hydrogen bonding. This attractive force, along with other intermolecular forces, is one of the principal factors responsible for the uh, occurrence of things like surface tension. We see this spider. He's just hanging out on top of the water. Is he sinking? No, he's just hanging out. It's because of surface tension. This is also the main reason why uh, solid water floats in liquid water. Because as, because as that that crystal as that ice actually forms okay the water molecules because of this hydrogen bonding is actually pushed away from each other making it less dense and this is also which we'll look at here uh, it, it also allows for water to be drawn from the root all the way to the top of the tree because you think about a water molecule is pulled out of the stomata at the leaf is it not holding on to another water molecule, which is holding on to another water molecule, which is holding on to another one via hydrogen bonding? We can think of, let's say that you and all of your classmates get in a big long line, you all hold hands, you're all water molecules and you're holding hands and, and the, the attraction of that holding hands, that's your hydrogen bond. You, now, uh, you gotta stay uh, together. Don't, don't, don't drop hands, right? And so, uh, let's say your teacher gets in front of the very first person in line. He, is a warm, he or she is a warm, whipping wind, right? A warm, dry wind. And, and that's going to cause the first person to leave the room. Well, if the, if the first person leaves the room, the second person's going to leave the room, the third person's going to leave the room, the fourth person's going to leave the room, until, and, and you just all just snake right on out of the room. It's this, it's this same uh, concept here, okay? Going all the way from the roots, all the way to the tip top of the chute, all the way, hundreds of feet in some instances, to the top of the tree, right? So, 
Uh, before we leave this slide, I want to make the distinction, just so you know that, that there is a difference between what we call a hydrogen bond and a bonded hydrogen. Okay? And if we look at one of these water molecules, this white hydrogen atom here is bonded to this red oxygen. Now they're not actually red and white. But this is a bonded hydrogen. This is a hydrogen bond. Okay? So let's talk about adhesion and cohesion. Adhesion is basically because of uh, hydrogen bonding. Water is able to form bonds with other things besides other water molecules. See, it's when it bonds to itself. That's cohesion. Adhesion is when that water molecule, when those water molecules are able to form a bond with, let's say, the xylem cell walls. Okay. So, transpiration. Um, what we're talking about is water is constantly lost out of the leaf by this process. When one water molecule is lost, another is pulled along by the processes of cohesion and adhesion. This, is, this transpirational pull, utilizing capillary action and the inherent surface tension of water is the primary mechanism of water movement in plants. Okay, But it's not the only mechanism involved. Any use of water in leaves forces water to move into them. Transpiration in leaves creates tension. It's a differential pressure in the mesophyll cells. Because of this tension, water is literally being pulled up from the roots to the leaves, helped by cohesion, the pull between individual water molecules due to hydrogen bonds, and adhesion, remember, the stickiness between water molecules and the hydrophilic cell walls of plants, again by hydrogen bonding, this mechanism of water fl flow works because of water potential. Water flowing from a high concentration of water to a lower concentration of water. Okay? Water flows from a high to a low potential in the rules of simple diffusion, obviously. So negative pressure, which, we call, which we'll call tension here, at the air-water interface in the leaf is the basis of transpirational pull. Okay, this is going, which is going to draw water out of the, out of the xylem. All right, so so let, let's just walk through uh, what's going on here with transpirational pull. Okay, number one. Okay, in transpiration, water vapor, which is shown with blue dots here, diffuses from the moist air spaces of the leaf to the drier air outside via the stomata. Okay, so this water, these what this water vapor is going out of this uh, stoma. Okay, remember the stomata is surrounded by the guard cells here. Okay, number two. Okay, at first the water vapor lost by transpiration is replaced by evaporation from the water film that coats the mesophyll cells. Number three. The evaporation of the water film causes the air-water interface to retreat farther into the cell wall and to become more curved. So you can see that right there. This curvature increases the surface tension and the rate of transpiration. Number four, right here. The increased surface tension showed in step, uh, shown in step three pulls water from the surrounding cells and air spaces. Finally, in number five. Water from the xylem is pulled into the surrounding cells and air spaces to replace water that's lost. So let's ode to the hydrogen bond. This is a very simplified uh, picture of what's going on here. Okay? You have uptake across the root, right here. Okay? Hydrogen bonds allow cohesion between water molecules in the xylem. Hydrogen bonds allow adhesion between these water molecules and the cellulose xylem cell. Okay, and then finally you have evaporation from the leaf. So let's talk about water potential. And I don't want this to scare you. Okay, we're gonna walk through this step by step. Okay? Water potential basically quantifies the tendency of free, which is 
it's, it's free water, so it's not bound to solutes, to move from one area to another due to osmosis, gravity, mechanical pressure, or matrix effects such as tension, um, surface tension. Water potential is the physical property that predicts the direction in which water will flow. The unit for water potential is the megapascal. By definition, the water potential of pure water in, an, in a container open to the atmosphere under standard conditions, which we will quantify as 25 degrees Celsius at one atmosphere of pressure, is zero megapascals. Water potential has proved especially useful in understanding water movement within plants, animals, and soil. Water potential is typically expressed in potential energy per unit volume and very often is represented by the Greek letter psi. So that we see this right here. Okay? And it looks like a pitchfork a little bit. One megapascal is equal to about 10 times atmospheric pressure at sea level. The internal pressure of a living plant cell due to osmotic uptake of water is about 0.5 megapascals, or about twice the air pressure inside an inflated car tire. The addition of solutes to water lowers the water potential. That's what we talked about a while ago. You add more solutes, you make it more hypertonic. This lowers the water's potential. Okay, that's going to make the water potential um, quantity negative. Just as the increase in pressure increases the potential. So if you increase pressure, it's going to make the water potential more positive. Pure water is usually defined as having an osmotic potential of zero. And in this case, solute potential can never be positive. Okay, so why do we have this annoying negative sign convention in the first place? Okay, let's think about this. Because adding a solute to water interferes with the intermolecular forces water molecules have for each other, okay, so hydrogen bonding being the most famous, if something dissolves in water, it is because water is more attracted to that solute particle than to the neighboring water molecules via cohesion. So the water molecules uh, become less likely to move. Thus, their potential to do work is decreased, uh, hence the negative sum slapped on those numbers. Okay? Free water moves from regions of high water potential to regions of lower water potential if there's no barrier to its flow. The word potential refers to water's potential energy, which is water's capacity to perform work. And it, when it moves from a region of higher water potential to a region of lower water potential. Okay? So let's look at this at the water potential equation. Okay? Water potential is equal to the solute potential plus the pressure potential. Okay? Solute potential directly proportional to the molarity or the amount of solute concentration within that particular solution. Okay? We sometimes call that the osmotic potential. Okay? And again, since pure water has no solutes, then the solute potential would be zero. Okay? And then, uh, again, uh, pressure potential is given to us by this uh, sign right here. All right. Pressure potential is the physical pressure exerted on a particular solution. It can either be positive or negative relative to the atmospheric pressure. Okay, and we're going to talk about both positive and negative here in just a little second. I'm sorry, in just a little bit. Water in a non-living hollow uh, xylem cell is under a negative potential, under tension of less than negative 2 megapascals. But the water in a living cell is usually under positive pressure due to the osmotic uptake of water. Okay, now remember, hollow xylem cells are dead at maturity, so they're, they're basically a straw at that point. All right, so let's go through each one of these scenarios <clears throat> one by one, okay? Water moves from a region, let, let me just remind you, water moves from a region of high water pressure to regions of low water pressure. 
So let's take these scenarios one by one. So let's, let's look at, at number one here. All right, I've got a U-tube right here with a semi-permeable membrane that's permeable to water. Okay, so water can go both in and out. So, we, so as of when we start, we have no net movement of water. Okay, so what did, what, so what did we do here? We added solutes to the right arm. Okay, so let's just think about this. Basically, what we, what we have done is we've made the right side of this thing more hypertonic. Okay? And so where is the greatest amount of water concentration? It's on the left, right? So where would you assume the water would go from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration? Okay? So basically... By adding solutes to the right side, if we can use our new water potential terms, we've lowered the water potential on the right-hand side. The water potential is higher on the left, so it has a greater potential to give water to the right-hand side, to a higher water potential, to a lower water potential. Okay? So, the, so therefore, we have a movement of water to the right arm. Okay, let's think about it uh, in this way. If a solute dissolves in water, it is because it's either ionic or polar in nature. Either way, the solute particles find water very attractive and set up intermolecular attractive forces which result in a less free water, uh, which reduces the capacity for water to move, flow, or do work. So you've lowered the water potential. This is a negative effect. Hence the negative sign convention on the number. So a 0.1 molar sugar solution has a solute potential of negative 0.23 megapascals. So as the solute concentration or molarity increases, so does the negative value of the solute potential. So why does the water move from the, uh, to the right side of this U-tube? Why osmosis, of course. Let's look at number two. We have the same U-tube, same situation, and now we have applied a positive pressure on the right-hand side. Right? So we've increased the water potential. Remember, if we increase pressure potential, it, it, that's a positive. It increases the water potential. So we've increased the water potential on the right-hand side. So where's the water go? Well, that right. It's going to go to the left because now there is a greater water potential on the right-hand side than the left-hand side. Okay, we've, we've applied a mechanical pressure to the right side. In the absence of solutes now, you, you see that there's no solutes. The water is mechanically forced to the left-hand side. Okay, all right, so let's put these together in number three. Now we have solutes and we have positive pressure. Okay, so in, in this example, we have solutes, which is going to work to lower the pressure potential. But look what else we did. We added a positive pressure. So what happens? The, the negative solute potential equals out the positive pressure potential, and so you have a net water potential of zero. So now you still have the exact same situations we had in number one. I I'm sorry, uh, in, uh, in our original, we have no net movement across this semi-permeable membrane. Okay? Now, let's look at some negative pressure. Have you ever uh, drank... Uh, uh, a soda, water, tea, lemonade, whatever, out of a straw, you're not actually um, sucking that liquid into your mouth. Basically what you're doing is you are creating negative pressure. Okay, When you take that atmospheric pressure out of that straw, there's more pressure at the bottom. And so basically it's not that you are um, uh, sucking that that liquid up, you're actually creating a scenario where that liquid is actually pushed up that straw, right? And so when we think about transpirational pull, 
basically what's happening is, is we have negative pressure that is going to then um, uh, pull that water up that side. So if we create negative pressure on the right hand side here, it's actually going to pull water to the right hand side. Right? Let's think about this in terms of water potential. You are decreasing the water potential by creating a negative pressure potential. You are decreasing the water potential on the right hand side. So where does water flow? From a high constant so a higher water potential to a lower water potential. And that's why that's what's going to pull this water up through the xylem. Okay? This is an example of uh, of this negative pressure, this tension that occurs during transpiration. It's important to note that the water potential of air is extremely negative. I mean, folks, it's about negative 65 megapascals. Okay? And since water moves toward the more negative potential, transpiration is favored. Okay? So I want us to be able to put tonicity with uh, with water potential, okay? These vocab terms. So we're familiar with isotonic uh, or isoosmotic solutions where you have an equal uh, an equal number of solutes in and out of a particular cell. Hypotonic, if you put a cell in a hypotonic solution, that means that you are putting a, a cell in a solution that has less solute, therefore less I'm sorry, therefore less, um, well, less solutes, more water. Hypertonic solution would be you can put a cell in a solution that has more solutes, less water. So where's water going to flow if you put this cell into a hypertonic? Well, it's going to flow from a high water concentration to a lower water co concentration. Well, let's look at that in terms of water potential. Okay? This cell is going to have more water potential than the, than the solution. Water is going to flow from a region of high concentration to a lower concentration or a, a higher water potential to a lower water potential. Same thing with um, hypotonic. You put a cell in a high, hypotonic solution that has more water. Where's the water going to go? It has more water concentration. Therefore, it has a higher water potential. Where, water, where does water go? From a region of higher concentration to lower concentration. From a region of higher water potential to a lower water potential. Right? Alright. So, let's look at some water potential and some of this uh, plant vocabulary. What's going on here? Okay, so we know that these plant cells are surrounded by a cell wall, but they also have that plasma membrane, that phospholipid bilayer, that cell membrane, that plasma membrane, just like we have, right, in our cells. So if you put that cell into a hypertonic solution and it loses water, right, that cell membrane is going to shrink in and you're going to see plasmolysis occur. Okay, so... Um, Again, green arrows are water moving out. Yellow arrows are moving uh, as water moving in. With an isotonic solution, we see no net movement. We see no net movement of water. Equal parts going in and out. Okay, but that is going to cause a plant to to become flaccid. What a plant cell needs is a good amount of turgor pressure. So what they want is they want to be turgid. They want in a hypotonic solution, lots and lots of water, a, a solution that has a high, high, high water potential because they need all that water to rush in so that plasma membrane can go and exert a, a, a force on that cell wall. That's going to give them rigidity, okay? So, all right, so let's just look at just look at a couple of examples, okay? I know this says one more with feeling, but... I think there's another one coming up. So let's look for some, uh, let's just look at the initial conditions, all right? The cellular water potential is greater than the environmental water potential, okay? Look at the cell. It has a, it has a, a water potential of negative 0.7 megapascals. 
It has zero pressure potential and has a solute potential of negative 0.7 megapascals. Okay? Let's look at the solution. It as well has zero pressure potential but has a solute potential of negative 0.9. Okay? So we see that the greater pressure, I'm sorry, the greater water potential is inside of the cell. So where is the water going to go? Remember, it, the water is going to travel from a region of higher water potential to a region of lower water potential. Okay? Therefore, the water is going to travel out of the cell. Let's, let's think about this another way. Okay? What would cause this environment this solution that you've put the, the cell in, what would cause that? What did cause that to have a lower water potential? Well, look here. It's the solutes. Obviously, because this has a is more negative, the solute potential here is more negative on the outside than inside, it has more solutes. Remember, when you add solutes, you make yourself more hypertonic. That's going to lower the water potential, right? Give you less of potential if you are the environment of the cell to give water. So, let's look at some ways that you might explain this situation on the AP Biology test, okay? So, let's look at some, uh, some typical student responses that I've seen in my classes before. Okay, maybe a cell, I'm sorry, maybe a student says, well, the cell loses water and it plasmalizes. That's good, but it's not good enough. It's not where we need to be, okay? We need to add in the why. Why? The cell loses water and plasmalizes because water moves from a high water potential to a low water potential. It's so much better, right? Still not where we need to be, though. So let's add some data, okay? The fact that water potential for the cell is negative 0.7 megapascals, that's supposed to be 0 0.7, 0 0.7 megapascals versus the surrounding solution with a cell potential of 0.9 megapascals, water moves out of the cell. It's almost good enough. It's so much better than the, uh, than the very beginning one, but it really hasn't. Um, it, it's been quantified, but it's not where we need to be yet because we need to explain what does this mean. All right, so let's look at a really, really great answer here, okay, to explain again this whole situation that we have going on right here, okay? So here's what we want to see. Water moves from an area of high water potential at negative 0.7 megapascals to an area of lower water potential at negative 9 0.9 megapascals. Therefore, water moves out of the cell into the surroundings and plasmalizes. Now, you see how, how not only did we explain what happened, but we gave it a why, we gave it some data, and we, we said, why, why is this, why do, why is this, what does this mean? Why do we care, right? Okay, awesome. All right, so let's look at just one more. Um, basically, um, the cell now has um, the water potential is less than the environmental pot uh, water potential. Let's just look at this, okay? So we place a cell in distilled water, okay? Which we said earlier, pure water has uh, a water potential of zero. So you can see here, it has zero pressure potential. It has no solute, so there is no solute potential, okay? So now let's look at this cell. This cell has a pressure potential because of that turgor pressure. We see a pressure potential of 0.7. Okay. And we see um, it has a solute potential of 0.7. Okay. Negative 0.7. So it's got some, obviously it's got some solutes in there. So where's the water going to go? From a region of higher to a region of lower water potential. Okay, so it's going it's to go in. And what is, the, what is the result of that? We have a turgid cell. Okay? All right. 
So what would a typical student, what, uh, what have I seen before? Okay, um, the cell gains water, becomes turgid. Now again, that's not where we need to be. So what do we want to see? We want to see uh, the cell gains water and becomes turgid because the surrounding water potential is higher at zero megapascals than the cellular water potential at negative 0.7 megapascals and water moves from an area of high potential which is in the surroundings to lower potential in the cell thus water moves into the cell making it turgid that's a much better answer right so when we have all this water and it's rushing into the cells and it's making that cell turgid okay that's going to prevent wilting at if you put um, those cells in either a hypertonic or even an isotonic we have wilting okay so you can you can walk up to this plant right here that is wilted you can water that and because of those processes that we have talked about the roots take in that water and they through transpirational pull it goes all the way up that xylem and out into the leaves with making that addition of the water making those cells turgid we actually have this coming from this plant so let's talk about the ascent of the xylem sap hydrogen bonding allows water molecules to form an unbroken chain extending from the leaves down to the soil the force driving the ascent of xylem sap is a gradient of water potential for bulk flow over long distance the water potential gradient is due mainly to the gradient of pressure potential. Transpiration results in the pressure potential at the leaf end of the xylem being lower than the pressure potential at the root end. The, the water potential values shown uh, at the left are, a, are basically they're just a snapshot. These are going to vary uh, during, the day, uh, during daylight, uh, but the direction of water potential remains the same. Now look at what's going on here. Negative 0.3, negative 0.6, negative 0.8, negative 1, negative 7. Out of the air we've got negative 100 megapascals, depending on how dry the air is. Look, what is the water potential doing from the roots as it goes up? It's getting more and more negative. Where does water flow? from a region of higher water potential to a region of lower water potential right so water is just going to flow up we've created this gradient of water potential okay so what would cause let's say the water potential to decrease in the soil to go below 0.3 megapascals well a loss of water or drought would make this water potential more negative, wouldn't it? Because if you take away water, what have you made that? That's that quote unquote solution down there. We've made it more hypertonic, right? You've and therefore you've decreased the water potential. What effect would this change in water potential of the soil have on transpiration? It would decrease the amount of transpiration, wouldn't it? Let's look at the stomata uh, and how they regulate transpiration rate. When water moves into the guard cells from neighboring cells by osmosis, they become more turgid. The structure of the guard cell walls cause them to bow outward in response to incoming water. This bowing increases the size of the pore, or the stomata, the stoma, between the guard cells, allowing for an increase in gas exchange. Okay? It's important, uh, let, let, let me just ask you a few questions here. Why is it important for the guard cells to open? What if we just left them closed? What can we not get in or release if that stomata is closed? The, this, it's, it's for gas exchange. We have to be able to get carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. That's where it comes in, right? We release, ox or, well, I guess plants release oxygen out of that it's also where transpiration occurs that's where the water vapor comes out and transpiration is not all bad there is some cooling that comes along with this process 
okay? What is the consequence of, of guard cells staying open then? Well, it's just going to dehydrate, right, because of transpiration. What reactant for photosynthesis is gaseous? That's the carbon dioxide. What product is, ga what product is gaseous from photosynthesis? That comes out again, oxygen. Now, one of the most important concepts that we can apply throughout the curriculum in, in biology is structure equals function, or uh, you can think of it as form fits function. Okay? So think about this kidney shape of these guard cells. You have one side thicker uh, than the other. So when these cells become turgid, look what happens. It, it opens up, right? Isn't that cool? So, homeostasis and water regulation, okay? Here, here we see that the stoma is closed, okay? When the guard cells lose water and become flaccid, they become less bowed, and then it closes, okay? Which limits gas exchange and limits the amount of transpiration that can occur. The changes in turgor pressure in guard cells, why does this water flow in and out like this, okay? It's largely due to the reversible absorption and loss of potassium ions that we see in red here, okay? Stoma open when guard cells actively accumulate potassium from neighboring epidermal cells which lower their water potential. So let's think about this again. You have this accumulation of of these potassium ions inside, okay? That lowers the water potential, again, making it more hypertonic, making them more apt to gain water, right? And when they gain water, they become turgid, which opens them up, okay? So, when these, uh, when these potassium ions, again, using that channel protein that we looked at um, earlier in the screencast, when you get those uh, potassium ions out, that decreases, I'm sorry, that increases the water potential. You have decreased um, the ability to take water in, and now you've increased the ability to, to shove water out, making these cells flaccid and closing. Trees that experience a prolonged drought may compensate by losing part of their crown as a consequence of leaves dying and being shed. And we see some browning going along in the, uh, on the crown of this tree. Resources may be reallocated so that more energy is expended for root growth in search for additional water. Okay? So what evolutionary role do plants sur uh, surviving drought conditions play? Okay? Well, these plants have adaptations that contribute to their survival. These adaptations may be passed on to future generations, allowing them to thrive in more arid environments. So, let's look at these arid environment type plants. We see some cacti, some desert plants, okay? What are their adaptations? Did a cactus get up in the morning for instance, and say, you know what, I'm not going to have leaves today. No. Over time, plants that had less leaves or thinner leaves, right, or even like a cactus, it has no leaves whatsoever unless you, unless you count the leaf uh, modification with those spines, right? But the photosynthesis is basically going on and that that in the trunk of that cactus, right? So it's over time those plants were they were able to have these adaptations were able to survive in this particular type of environment. So let's look at some of these adaptations. Leaves that are thick and hard with few stomata placed only on the underside of the leaf. Now why on the underside of the leaf? Because that is out of the direct sunlight. Okay, leaves covered with trichomes. These, these are like plant hairs, 
okay, which reflect more light, thus reducing the rate of transpiration. Leaves with stomata locates in surface pits. So basically, basically you have the stomata inside of these pits right down in here okay so the wind is going to rush through here and if the stomata was around here you might that might increase transpiration but if you place the stomata right here in between these little guard cells right here you've decreased the amount of transpiration okay Leaves that are also leaves that are spine like with stems that carry out photosynthesis, like the cacti that we were talking about a while ago. And also, you have these succulent leaves, or you have this cacti which is basically able to store a tremendous amount of water. And you have to be able to store water because you're not going to get a tremendous amount of precipitation, right? Let's look at natural selection and flooding, okay? Plants that experience prolonged flooding are going to have problems. You can't just uh, put a tremendous amount of water that's not going to be able to drain through the soil. Okay? These plants can drown. Roots underwater cannot obtain the oxygen needed for cellular respiration and ATP synthesis. As a result, leaves may dry, may actually dry out, causing the plant to die. Okay? Additionally, production of hormones that, produce, that promote root synthesis are greatly suppressed. Okay, So what are some adaptations that some plants have had to living in environments that either flood a lot or, like a wetland, are going to have water uh, almost always there? Okay, So here are some examples of some plants that are adapted over time, over many generations, due to natural selection and evolution, they have adapted to live in these environments. So plants have adapted to wet environments have the following adaptations. They have the forma uh, formation of large lenticels. These lenticels are basically pores in the stem that they can get, uh, they, that they can have gas exchange through. Okay, the formation of adventitious roots that that these roots actually go above the water that are going to increase gas exchange. The formation of stomata only on the surface of the leaf. Now think about this: we have a, a an aquatic environment. You have like a water lily. Okay, you have some of these aquatic plants here. The stomata is not going to help you a whole lot on the underside because what's the underside of the leaf touching? That's right, it's under water, right? So where do you want that gas exchange? Well, you want it on the top of the leaf because that's what's touching the air. We also have the formation of a layer of air-filled channels called arenchyma. This is for gas exchange, which moves gases between the plant above the water and the submerged tissues. Okay. Now let's look at bulk flow of photosynthetic products. When we say photosynthetic products, what we mean is um, the sugars. Okay, it's the the carbohydrates that are made in photosynthesis. Okay, and we call this translocation. We call this bulk flow, translocation, pressure flow, mass flow, that type of thing. Okay. So basically, let's just start with number one. Okay, we have the loading of sugar. The sugar is going to be our, our green dots. These are our products of photosynthesis. We're going, uh, we have the loading of those in the sieve tube at the source, which reduces the water potential inside the sieve tube members. Okay, so you, you, we, we've added sucrose. We've added solutes. We've decreased the water potential. Where's water go? From a region, look over here from a region of higher water potential to a region of lower water potential. So water flows from the xylem over here into the phloem. So now we've got the, what we call phloem sap. Okay. This uptake of water generates a positive pressure that forces the sap to flow on down. Okay. And it gets down to what we call a sink 
cell. So let's just say that this is either a fruit or a storage root, that type of thing, okay? So the pressure is relieved by the unloading of this sugar at the sink, okay? So when, you, when we get rid of that sucrose, the water will then, that, that increases the water potential, causes the water to flow back over into the, into the xylem. So in, the, in, the, in this case of leaf to root translocation, xylem is going to be able to recycle water from source to sink, from sink to source. So let's talk about some nutritional adaptations in plants. Okay? Epiphytes are types of plants that grow on other types of plants. Now they do not harm the host, but we see this staghorn fern that's just growing on this tree. Okay, it's basically just giving it a place to live. All right. Now mistletoe is a parasitic plant, and it's going to actually dig down, and it's going to absorb water, minerals, and sugars from their host. It is parasitic. Okay, it's kind of like um, us having a tapeworm. Um, we literally are eating everything that we want, and we're still losing weight. Right? Why? Because that tapeworm is a parasite. It's eating what we are putting in, right? And it's just getting longer and longer and longer. Yuck. We also have carnivorous plants. I love these things, okay? They're photosynthetic, but they're also heterotrophic. Isn't that beautiful? They're autotrophic and heterotrophic, right? They're going to supplement their mineral diet Okay, maybe because because they don't have the minerals in this uh, in this in these poor soils, right? These are often found in nitrogen poor soils, right? So they're able they're going to supplement their diet with some meat, right? So here in this picture we see a pitcher plant. Now this pitcher plant is beautiful because it it looks like. Kind of like uh, kind of like this. And so that ant is going to crawl down in there. And there's all these downward facing hairs. Okay? Now, this makes for a really, really great horror story because you can crawl down. But you know what you can't do? You can't get back up. You know what's waiting for you? some digestive enzymes. And when you come down here, it's just going to start digesting you alive. Isn't that horrible? Now, you may have already um, be familiar with the Venus flytrap. I'll tell you what, the Venus flytrap is great because it actually has these two hairs. And if, let's say you're a fly, and you're just like, hey, that smells good. I'm just going to land on this, uh, this leaf that looks like a mouth. Right? You touch one of those hairs, and, and if you touch another crucial trichome, this, this another, uh, another crucial hair, bam, just closes down on you. Okay? Now, I've actually watched Venus flytrap, uh, Venus flytraps do this, and I'm going to be honest with you. I have chased a many a fly in my lifetime and not been able to catch them. I have a fly on my leg or on the table and <laughs> try to get it. It's not able to get it. I can't get it, right? That Venus flytrap, <laughs> bam, closes on it almost every time. It's beautiful. All right, so let's look at some halophytes. These halophytes basically are going to live in, in environments that are uh, very rich in salt. Now, what salt tells you is that it is extremely... Uh, um, hypertonic, okay? Extremely, uh, solutions that are extremely, have a, a, a much lower water potential, okay? So how are these plants not able to just dry out, right? Because if you and I were to, to fall off of, let's say, a cruise ship in the middle of the ocean, and we're just bobbing up and down in the waves, and we get thirsty, Okay? We cannot drink that water. 
ladies and gentlemen, we cannot, because that's salty. We're going to, we're, what happens is we're going to drink that water. We're actually going to, um, our body's going to compensate because we're dehydrating, right? We drank this salty water and now we're starting to dehydrate. So how are these plants able to do this? The soil salinity around the world is increasing. We have to be cognizant of this. Many plants, are, many plants around the world are being killed by too much salt in the soil. Okay? Some plants have adapted, however, to growing in saline con these saline conditions. They can do this by having spongy leaves with water stored that basically is going to dilute the salt in the roots or they can actively transport salt out of the roots or block the salt from being able to enter in. Okay? Or they can produce high concentrations of organic molecules in the roots to alter the water potential gradient of the leaves. So, this is the end of this screencast. And I realized this was long, and I, I, what I encourage you to do is to go back, stop, um, take note, stop this screencast whenever you need to, uh, watch it as many times you need to, stop, take a break, that type of thing, and use this as a tool to um, make sure that when you are asked about plant nutrition and plant transport, that you are able to pro provide some examples, and please, 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 um, when you answer questions, whether it be about plants or whether it be about anything, don't just give them the what. Give them the why. Give them some data, and please just tell them what all of that, all that data and the what and the why mean. Okay? Have a have such a great day.